So let's have a look at WPA3 and especially the authentication method that it used to identify uh, a client and an access point. Along the way, we'll have a look at uh, some of the earlier standards for, for wireless and also their basic weaknesses. So basically, we've evolved through WEP, which was a, almost a complete disaster of a security protocol, it used a very short encryption key, 72 bits is probably where we are with brute force, so 40 bits is a very small key, which these days could be easily cracked even by a desktop computer. It used a weak cipher, RC4, a stream cipher, and had a very short initialization vector, which meant that the initialization vector rolled over within a given amount of time, and then the intruder just had to XOR the same initialization vector data, uh, and they would reveal the, the message. Single key was used for the whole network, and intruder could actually perform in a man in the middle and flip bits on the encrypted uh, data frames. WPA2 was a, a software up, a firmware upgrade between web and WPA and introduced to TKIP, which is a better cipher, uh, had a 128-bit key, much longer, longer initialization vector, and then there was a renegotiation of the keys before the initialization vector rolled over. Then we saw a much better uh, infrastructure, secure infrastructure with WPA2 or 802.11i. That brought a block cipher such as AES and the four-way handshake. The disaster of WEP was that it was a 24-bit initialization vector. This is how it works. The passphrase and initialization vector go in to RC4. It creates a pseudo-infinitely long uh, encryption uh, key stream which is XORed with the text. Uh, that produces our cipher, but we've got to send the initialization along with the, uh, with the cipher so that the other side can actually feed in the passphrase plus the initialization vector to do the same, to, to XOR again, and then end up with the text. Simple method, uh, but it was really flawed. And it was flawed because it only had to the power of 40 keys, uh, if we take 100 million keys to crack a second, which is actually quite slow by these standards, the whole network could be cracked within three hours. It was a 40-bit encryption key. It was a global encryption key for the whole network, which meant that once it was cracked, then the intruder could read all of the communications. And it also lacked any form of proper error checking where bits could be flipped. So the four-way handshake was introduced and basically it was a better way uh, to be able to stop the cracking of the, the global key. So what is created is a global uh, key between the access point and the client and then all keys are then derived from this this global uh, pass, pass key. If that's cracked then all of the keys are then uh, crackable because they're all derived from that. So when a client uh, wants to connect to an access point, it performs a four-way handshake. What happens in here is that we use a hash of the SSID of the access point and also the password. So the value that's passed is that hashed value. We use PBKDFS2 because it's actually a very slow hashing method. But with these days, we have cloud-based instances which can uh, perform fairly extensive uh, hashing, hash cracking operations. So this is an example of some Python code. And we can see here, we end up with what's called the pairwised master key. And this is derived, and then this will be used between the client and the access point. If this is cracked, then all of the keys and all of the, the, the resulting keys and the password of the access point is actually broken. And all that needs to happen is that uh, we take that offline, we look at the, the, the negotiation and this, this hash value and then try and find with a whole lot of uh, passphrases uh, a match for that hashed value. 
We slow it down though with PBK DFS2 and a few years ago that was fine but with the advent of GPUs and cloud cracking really uh, it is possible to, to break this, this hashing method. So the core weaknesses are around the four-way handshake and we're into the can take the hashes, the hashed values offline and then perform a dictionary or a brute force attack. So that, that performs an offline crack with a single capture of an association. A single crack then breaks all the other keys, so there is no forward secure secrecy uh, built into it. So the advent of WP3 uh, brings along two theme themes. WP2 Enterprise was fairly robust and uses a back-end uh, authentication server and it's using proper encryption key exchange methods such as elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and it has proper signing. So WP3 uh, just enhances this and brings along new uh, crypto methods. It's WP3 Personal which is the one which is a massive upgrade over WP2 Personal. And with this we bring in what's called Simultaneous Authentication of Equals or SAE which is based uh, on the uh, dragonfly uh, method which was used in mesh networks and is defined in 802.11s. WPA3 also gives an easy way to be able to get the credentials of a network using QR codes. So there are two phases to uh, this uh, authentication with WPA3 personal. One is the commit where we initially pair with the access point and then after that we get a confirm. So the confirm is when we've actually been through the commit phase. We can confirm many times, but any time we can go back to the commit phase. The way it works is through the dragonfly uh, method. Initially, uh, Alice and Bob, uh, this could be the client and this could be the uh, access point, call them Alice and Bob just now, they generate two random numbers, A and B. Uh, Alice then computes A plus B and then mod Q, we take uh, Q as a prime number. All of our operations are done mod Q. And then we'll take element A, which is our hashed password as a value, as an integer, and then to the power of minus A. So I'll explain minus A in a little minute. But then Alice sends over this SA value and element A, and then she take, multiplies the two of them together and then raises it, Bob raises it to the power of B. Over here, Bob does the same thing and reg generates random values and then sends those values over. And, he, and Alice raises to the power of A. Then if we do the maths, then SB is B plus B. And this is multiply, we can add the logs together. So that becomes minus B and we cancel at B. B to the power of A is actually uh, to the power of AB. So in the end, the Bob and Alice end up with the same value. So this looks a little bit strange because we're dealing with integers here. So how do we create the code to be able to uh, to be able to raise something to the power of minus A? Well, the way that we do it is that we take the inverse mod of our value. So our value is p to the power of minus a, which is 1 over uh, pe to the power of a. And so what we do is we use the Euclidean, extended Euclidean method to take the inverse mod. Uh, and it's almost like taken to, taken to the power of, of minus 1, in this case to the power of minus a. So this is the method that we're using here. We take the inverse of it uh, uh, to mod q. And that will give us that. So there's the basic Python there. We're using the extended uh, Euclidean uh, method from there. So the code that we have, we'll just generate some A and B values. We'll, we'll add in some text and a, and a random prime number. Obviously, in real life, our, we'd have a much larger prime number. And then we'll take our scalar value, A plus A, plus a and then B plus B here. And then we'll take a kind of hash of, the, of our uh, password. In this case, we take a hash digest and we convert it to an integer 
and that becomes an integer value that we can now operate on uh, to uh, to raise it to the power in this case of the minus a the inverse uh, mod okay so we'll generate our values there's the value here uh, that we now calculate on the other side we can multiply them together raise them bob raises it to the power of b and alice raises it to the power of a and this is a diffie hellman exchange but we're now building in uh, authentication into Diffie-Hellman method because Diffie-Hellman method doesn't give us this automatically. We need some way to make sure that both Bob and Alice know the passwords. If they do both know the same passwords, then they will end up with the same value at the end and they have proven that they both know it. Eve sitting in the middle cannot tell what the password is and what the end uh, phrase actually is. So we can just do a quick run here. We'll try with a low one, two, three. We'll take a prime number of 151 and fingers crossed, hopefully we'll end up with the same shared key. It's only one in this case. I'll, I'll go for a bigger prime number. And we can see here, they both end up with the same value here. As I said, the values are likely to be much larger than that for the prime numbers. In the confirm stage, we take what's called the long term key, which we've just actually generated. We remember that and then we derive new keys from it. Uh, the intruder cannot find out what those keys are or hack any single one, even if they know one or they crack one of the keys. Okay, so that's the, the basic phases that, that we actually have. So in conclusion, uh, WPA is flawed and not really fit for purpose in this modern age of GPU crackers. Uh, as we, as GPUs and ASICs advance, really it becomes more and more flawed. And we need to look at uh, methods such as zero knowledge proof. Uh, it's crazy that we send passwords over a network and we even hash them we need to get rid of that method and move towards a way that the users will just prove that they know a secret, such as a password. Hash passwords are really a big problem with data breaches and we often see millions if not billions in the case of Yahoo being released into the wild and they can be easily picked off by users. So in conclusion, zero knowledge proof is the future and hash passwords need to be retired or deprecated into history. Thank you.